Y'all can be seated. I don't know about you, but I am feeling particularly thankful for our musicians this morning. Uh, from our choir to our guys on the instruments as well. I think about uh, that beautiful song, that worship song during the offertory, Let Everything That Has Breath Praise the Lord. We couldn't say that enough times. To say it over and over again, that everything, all of creation, declare the wonders and praises of our amazing, amazing God. So thank you to our choir. Thank you all for serving week in and week out and bringing your best. My name is Andrew Stepp. I'm the senior pastor here at the church. And if you are new here, as Wendy said earlier, it is our honor to have you with us this morning. If you're joining us on the live stream, we are grateful that wherever you are live streaming from, that you are worshiping with us. So turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. That's the last chapter in 1 Chronicles. The book that comes after 1 Chronicles is what? Well done, Bible scholars. Well done. It's a vacation weekend. It's hard. It's hard. That's okay. So next week is our final sermon in our core values series. Then we'll begin our summer sermon series called Messy Faith, exploring the book of Psalms. Does anyone else's life sometimes seem messy or discombobulated or just a little bit chaotic? God has given us this beautiful book of prayers to teach us how to express and live out our faith during the messiest of seasons. They are prayers expressed in the midst of anger, hurt, doubt, hatred, grief, betrayal, revenge. John Calvin found the Psalms to express, quote, the anatomy of all parts of the soul. Isn't that great? The anatomy of all parts of the soul. Uh, Ellen Davis, who's a theologian, she writes that the Psalms enable us to bring into our conversation with God feelings and thoughts most of us think we need to get rid of before God will be interested in hearing from us. Have you ever had those emotions pent up inside you that seem like I have to fix them or clear them out before God will hear my prayers? Well, the Psalms teach us how to do that how to bring ourselves honestly and vulnerably before God. So let me encourage you to be thinking about for the summer, and you could start this today, you could start it tomorrow, but I want all of us to commit ourselves to reading through the entire book of Psalms over the summer. If you read two per day, you will easily knock it out during the summer. Some of you want to read more than that, you could read four and you knock it out twice this summer. But however you choose to do it, don't do it too fast because I want you to slow down and reflect on these prayers. Put yourselves in the shoes of the person who's praying and the emotions in which they find themselves and allow God's word and God's spirit to work through that. The last few weeks we've been preaching on our core values as a church. The first three have been Jesus first. We hunger to grow closer to Jesus and deeper in his word. The second one was every generation. We disciple all generations from the youngest to the oldest to follow Jesus, recognizing that each generation is essential to the body of Christ. And last week we focused on deep-spirited community that we cultivate authenticity, vulnerability, and joy in our fellowship. And this community is deep-spirited indeed. It runs deeper than any civic club or recreational group, deeper than any political party. Through God's Spirit, He created a new community, a new family with people from different neighborhoods, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic circumstances, different ethnicities, languages, and countries. He's created a new community unlike any other in the world that is united by his spirit and the blood of Jesus. It is a deep-spirited community because the life of the church is tied to life in God's spirit. So as our passage said last week, 
We not only cling tenaciously to the hope we profess because our God can be trusted to keep his promises. We not only cling tenaciously ourselves, but we are responsible to encourage one another to cling tenaciously as well. If we are going to continue in the hope that has been passed on to us, that has been entrusted to us, we need each other. God designed this and created us, as we said last week, to be herd animals. We are a family together. We are a herd. We are a deep-spirited community committed to encouraging and building one another up. Today we shift our attention from the quality of our community to the quality of our own discipleship. So as we do this, I want you to consider this question. Who is the most generous person you've known? Who's someone that comes to mind who is a generous person? For me, my person, they fed me beans and rice. Let me explain to you a bit. Let me share with you about my friend Edith. Now, if you turn back the clock 25 years, Edith was 80 years old and I was 20 years old. She was a widow, and I remember her husband's funeral very well because there we were in the church, and we were singing the Hallelujah Course, and they opened up the Hallelujah Course, the organ did, and it got to the singing part, and I belted it out from the back pew as loud as I could before I realized that it was not supposed to be sung. It was only played. Like, who does that? Who does that? But I remember that. Edith and her husband... They were retired missionaries who had spent over 20 years in Peru and Colombia and then several more decades in mission work in the U.S. Now at that time I was on track to full-time ministry, not sure if that meant I was going to be a pastor in a church or I was going to be a missionary in South America and I was trying to figure out how to pay for college. Edith was an amazing lady, spiritually mature. She exuded joy despite her age and her health and the things that they had gone through. She had a a peaceful countenance in which that maturity and wisdom came out. There was no trace of fear or anxiety, but a calmness and peace. And as a mature follower of Christ, she was always listening. She was listening for where God wanted her to serve him. She was listening for where God wanted her to be generous. She was eager to serve. I hope you catch that, that we never outgrow that, right? It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. You are never too old to serve. You are never too young to serve. God wants to use us to serve him and encourage one another in every stage of life. But Edith heard my dilemma, she heard my, my story, and to make a long story short, she made a seemingly random but generous gift to help me pay for college and finish out my college and ministry training. But her generosity was so much more than that. I loved going over to her house. It was incredibly modest. She would make me black beans and rice. We never had an expensive meal, we never ate out, we literally ate beans and rice, and she would share with me stories about life on the mission field. She would talk about when she and her husband went to Columbia as missionaries right out of college in 1942. Think about what was going on in 1942. They had to take a ship across the Gulf of Mexico to Colombia to get there. Now, in 1942, in the Gulf of Mexico, underneath the waters were what? U-boats. So they had that fly. She talked about flying with a, a, uh, or on the ship, they flew a flag down the side of the ship with spotlights on it in hopes that the U-boats would recognize them as civilians and not sink them. She was truly a library of stories of God's faithfulness. There was a depth to Edith's generosity, a beauty to her generosity. She was, she was comfortable in her place in life. She was open-handed with what she had, which wasn't much. 
but her generosity had nothing to do with how much she had or an abundance in her bank account. Rather, she had a faith in a generous God, so she was ready and willing to be like him. Generosity comes in many shapes and sizes, doesn't it? And I'm sure if we were to be able to hear about all the people whose images came to your mind a moment ago, we would see the amazing ways we have all experienced and witnessed generosity. So our fourth core value is this, whole life generosity. We seek to be generous in all things just as God has been generous with us. Recognizing that everything we have is a gift from God, we serve one another and our neighbors near and far through selfless giving. Our beliefs about generosity capture not only how we use our finances, but also how we invest the time, talents, and experiences that God has entrusted to us to serve wherever he sends us. So a few weeks ago, we asked some of y'all about your experience and how you experienced this value in the life of our church. So let's hear what you had to say. What does whole life generosity mean to me? Well, whole life generosity to me means being generous with your time, talent, and resources and helping out others wherever you can. I take everything God gave me, money, my time, my talents that maybe I have that somebody else doesn't have to give back to not only the church and God's people, but to others outside the church to, to draw them into God, draw them into Jesus and, and understanding how much he loves them. I kind of think whole life generosity means that um, I, I just love Jesus and what he's done for my life so much that my cup overflows and I share that generosity with anyone I can. I think of the scripture where uh, David says, shall I give the Lord that which costs me nothing? Uh, that sense of uh, you should recognize that there is a lack that you might otherwise pursue with your will. There's something where you might send your will after, but because of your dedication to God, you see that thing as less important and less valuable. You see pursuing God as more important and more valuable. Putting others before yourself, others' needs before others, um, before, your, before your own needs. Um, I think that um, it's following in Christ's path for us. He's given us a roadmap to follow. Whole life generosity means to me living a life of selfless love um, in the church and giving back, being grateful for what you have and giving back to other people with a spirit of gratefulness. It's a generous invitation that God gives us to be connected with what he's doing in the world and to see what we have as ultimately his and to surrender it and to, to, to see it leave knowing that you might have another plan but knowing that, that God's plan is, is going to be better than yours. So what did you hear? I heard about selfless love. I heard it's an invitation to be a part of what God is doing in the world. So do Christians always look like that? I mean, you may be wondering, why are we even talking about generosity if we're already a generous church? Aren't all Christians generous people? Well, I want you to think about the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know the story. Guy gets beat up, left on the side of the road. The priest, the religious professional, passed him by. The Levite, the kind of like the lay leader, passed him by. Who is it that comes along and actually stops to help the man? The Samaritan, he was the generous one. Now, here's the deal. Often when we read these stories, we ask the question, how do I fit into it? Here's the key with the Good Samaritan. You are not the Good Samaritan. You are the priest and the Levite. I am the priest and the Levite who passed by on the other side of the road. Here's why Jesus was telling the story. He wasn't giving us this parable to teach us how amazing Samaritans are. He was making the point that God's people, us, we have a tendency to be ungenerous. We have a tendency to be unkind. So whenever we're looking at the teachings of Jesus, when we read the stories in the New Testament, what Jesus calls on us to do is to have an honest self-assessment. And an honest self-assessment doesn't pat ourselves on the back for being like the Good Samaritan, but recognizes that inside of each of us, 
is that priest and the Levite who passes by on the other sides of the road. If you think about the parable of the, of the prodigal son, we are the crabby, unforgiving, envious older brother in the story. And so we are invited by Jesus into a posture of listening and humility. MPC is a generous congregation, which is why it's one of our core values. However, we need to keep talking about it. We need to keep working at it because our human nature is ultimately always trying to undermine it. Our human nature is always trying to make us into people of the M&M gospel, more and more for me and mine. But that's not who we are called to be. So let's look at our Bible passage for today. Again, it's from 1 Chronicles. Here's a little context. King David is very old in this season and is going to die soon. So he is preparing his young son Solomon to become king. In this particular passage, he is handing off to him the most important construction project in Israel's history. What is it? The temple. David has left a huge amount of gold, silver, bronze, wood, marble, turquoise, all sorts of fine materials. You can read about it in chapter 29. And inspired by his example of generosity, verse 6 tells us that the leaders of the families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. Notice how it grows and expands from the smallest to the greatest, that they're inspired, everyone's inspired. The heads of each family, each household is inspired to give. The heads of the tribes are inspired to give. The heads of the military and the royal officials, they are all inspired to give. It says they gave toward the work of the temple of God, Gold, silver, bronze, iron. Anyone who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple. And the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders. For they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. So this brings us to our passage. Our verses that we're going to read are David's prayer. David is moved by this amazing outpouring of generosity for the building of the temple. And this is his prayer, so you can follow along in your Bibles or on the screens as I read it aloud. 1 Chronicles 29, beginning in verse 10. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our faith, Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things, and in your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and who are my people, that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. And give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes, and decrees and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. Then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed down, prostrating themselves before the Lord and the King. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God loves thoughtful, honest prayers, doesn't he? 
I love this prayer, this spontaneous outburst of joy and praise and thanksgiving and humility from David. So what we're going to do with the rest of the sermon is build a simple theology of generosity from David's prayer. I'm going to share with you five truths from this prayer, and I'm going to group them into two parts. So the first three are these. Truth number one, everything belongs to God already. Everything belongs to God already. Truth number two, God entrusts what is his to us to steward. And truth number three, this creates in us a humble spirit. Everything belongs to God already. God entrusts what is his to us to steward, and this creates in us a humble spirit. So truth number one, everything belongs to God already. Verse 11 says this, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Have you ever heard the comparison of an abundance mindset versus a scarcity mindset? Have you ever heard that before? So someone with an abundance mindset, that allows them to see possibilities even at times when resources are limited Whereas scarcity mindset is driven by fear that there will never be enough of the things that we need. God calls us to have an abundancy mindset when it comes to generosity, not because of everything we have, but because of who he is. Because of what he has and what he's doing that is greater and beyond us, that is wiser than us, that he is up to something. He wants us to be a part of it. And so he tells us not to be fearful about what little we have or what limited resources we have, but to live in the trust of God's abundance. Deuteronomy 8 says this, Moses is preaching to God's people before they enter the promised land. And he says this, You may say to yourself, Well, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant. Everything already belongs to God. Let everything on earth praise his name because it all belongs to him and comes from his hand. Truth number two, God entrusts what is his to us to steward. Again, in verse 11, it picks up, yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. So the earth is the Lord's and everything yet in it, and yet he asks us to partner with him, to steward his gifts. As Grant said in the video, he invites us to be a part of what he's doing and to imitate his generosity. So God created the garden and gave Adam and Eve responsibility for good use of his good gifts. Stewardship is the theological belief that humans, us, are responsible for taking care of the world that's been entrusted to us. So a biblical worldview of stewardship says something like this. It is utilizing and managing all our resources that God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of his creation. So the central essence of biblical stewardship is managing everything God brings into our life in a manner that honors God and impacts eternity. Truth number three, this leads us to a humble spirit. It creates in us a humble spirit. Verse 14, but who am I and who are my people? that we should be able to give so generously. Everything comes from you, Lord, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Generosity, recognizing that God is God and we are not, recognizing that all things come from his hand, it creates in us a genuineness and authenticity, a humility, a, a posture of listening for how God is calling us to serve him. 
how God is calling us to invest in his kingdom. It creates being comfortable in our own place. I'm not giving to show off, right? Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8 says this, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. So it forces this question of, do we trust God to provide? Do we trust God to provide enough for us to live? Do we trust God to provide enough for us to be generous? Okay, so our first three truths are these. Everything belongs to God already. God entrusts what is his to us to steward, and this creates in us a humble spirit. Now here are the last two. Truth number four, we respond with joy and willingness, and we make a long-term commitment. So truth number four, we respond with joy and willingness. Verse 17, he says this, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. It's amazing how encouraging and and inspiring generosity can be to see how God provides through everyone, through the whole congregation. So it creates in us, God's spirit does, an open-handedness, an open-handedness to life, to others, to the church, to people. It helps us be outwardly focused on the well-being of others, eager to serve, open and optimistic that when we are invited into God's story of generosity, it creates in us a joy and a willingness and excitement to be a part of what God is doing in the world. And I think that's why so many folks are coming to Mandarin and Prez right now because there's a sense that God is doing something. There's a sense that God is up to something in us, that he's creating something for his glory, for his gospel to be proclaimed here in Mandarin and Jacksonville and in the world. And that's exciting to be a part of what God is doing. Truth number five is this. We make a long-term commitment. So verse 18 says, and this is David praying for his son Solomon. Remember, he said, Lord, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. Give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commandments. Eugene Peterson described the Christian life our discipleship as a long walk in the same direction. Have any of you ever heard that phrase before? A long walk in the same direction. So in other words, our discipleship in general, following Jesus, is a journey, a lifelong journey. And like any journey, there are ups and downs. There are easy, flat parts, and there are mountainous, literally breathtaking, exhausting parts of the journey, but we keep heading in the same direction. Generosity is a lifetime journey moving in one direction toward Jesus. We have in that, if you think about financial generosity, that we're called to mature as givers. As givers, we mature. We may begin as a reluctant giver, and then we become more thoughtful, we become sacrificial, and we become, we become a lifetime giver. We move and mature in our faith from asking questions like, what am I supposed to do with my stuff, to what does God want me to do with my stuff, to what does God want me to do with God's stuff, to what does God want me to give from what God has provided, and ultimately, what does God want me to keep? From what he has provided. But we all begin somewhere in that journey. We all begin at the beginning of that journey and we take steps forward. Generosity, like discipleship, is a journey. When you become more generous with your life, the 
other things in life, they lose their grip on us. Sometimes I wonder if when it comes to giving gifts to the church, some may think that their gift doesn't matter or it's inconsequential because they don't or can't make gifts as large as other people. But I hope you know that every gift matters. It doesn't matter how large or how small the gift because it's about our heart. It's about our discipleship and following Christ. Giving is a way that we walk in faithfulness as we follow Jesus. And what makes a gift significant is not the size of the gift, but it's the size of our heart behind it. So generosity is not just a theology or a set of truths. It's a person. It's an example, right? We talked about that at the very beginning. Who came to mind, right? So over the last year, I've asked various groups within the church, what does a generous person look like? So I'm going to read off some of those answers that you gave to that. Some of those I've already sprinkled into the sermon, so they'll sound familiar. But I want you to listen to these, and in your, in your mind's eye, I want you to construct this person based off this description. So what does a generous person look like? They don't just give, but they sacrifice to give. They have a peaceful countenance, not fearful or anxious, rather a calmness and peace. They're mature in their faith. They don't give to show off. They give even when they have nothing. They're not defined by their stuff. They're not attached to their stuff. They're comfortable with where they are at in life, not wrapped up in what they've achieved. They're accessible. They're open. They exude a desire to help. They're eager to serve. They have a posture of listening. They're flexible and open to change if God says so. There's a genuineness, an authenticity to them. No pretense. Their generosity is not transactional. They don't expect anything in return. Their joy and generosity is not conditioned by circumstances. They are open and optimistic, outwardly focused on others. They understand grace. Instead of being tight-fisted, there's an open-handedness to life and to others. They are a transformed person. A transformed person. Isn't that a description of a beautiful person? Don't you want to be that person? Here's the thing, if you walk away with nothing else from the sermon this morning, I want you to remember this. To be generous is to be like Jesus. To be generous is to be like Jesus because God is a giver. God so loved the world that he gave a precious gift, his son, to model his priority and his activity, to give up something valuable for a higher cause or calling. And God's higher cause was his love for each of us. He gave us Jesus. So financial giving at MPC is about more than meeting a budget. It's about encouraging a culture of people who act like Jesus. He embodies generosity. You see, generosity transforms us because God designed us to be generous people. So the next steps, I want you to think about how you are generous. What does your generosity look like? So we are called to have well-rounded generosity, time, talents, and treasures. It's not pick one and leave the other two alone or pick two and leave the third one, but it's all three. So where am I on my discipleship journey regarding giving? So you don't have to be advanced all the way down the journey, but where are you at? Start with something. Going from zero to something is the biggest step of all. But generosity is about a lot more than merely giving financially, right? 
Yesterday, my daughter and I, we walked to a friend's house yesterday. They had friends over, company. We had a wonderful time of fellowship. And as we were walking back to our house about a mile walk or so, I asked Channing, of course, you know, pastors were always farming for sermon illustrations, right? And I asked my daughter, I'm like, hey, so I'm going to be preaching about generosity tomorrow. So when you think of generosity, what image comes to mind? And she said, without missing a beat, she's like, Well, those folks that we were just at their house. As I walk away from there with blueberry French toast in my belly and a glass of orange juice that was given to me as I left, they were so kind and they're such generous friends. Generosity extends way beyond just what we do with our finances. So asking the question, how am I giving of my time? How am I serving? If you need ways to serve this summer, we can help you, particularly SCAMP, our VBS that's coming up in a few weeks. We need volunteers for that. Volunteer your time. Volunteer your time for that. I am so thankful for our volunteers on the cameras and in the sound booth, our ushers, our greeters. There are lots of opportunities to give and to serve with our time. And then finally, I would say take an inventory of your life. How has God wired you to serve him? What are the gifts and talents that God has uniquely given you? If God's given you the gift of hospitality, then use it to honor him. If you have that ability to create safe space for people where you provide for them, you care for them, do that. If God's given you the gift of music, sing, play your instrument, talk to Bill. Use those gifts to volunteer to serve God, maybe God's given you the gift of prayer or teaching. Maybe God's given you the gift of generating wealth. Ask yourself, why did God give me this gift? How am I supposed to use this gift that he's given me? But ultimately, where is my heart in all of this? Where is my heart in all of this? Do I express generosity through my attitude and the way I treat others. Friends, generosity is the fruit of a life that has been transformed by Jesus. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we give thanks to you for your generosity, for your kindness. We pray that we would be generous just as you are, not just with our finances, but even more importantly with our hearts, Lord, with the gifts that you've given us, with the talents you've given us, with the time you've entrusted to us. Lord, we want to use all of it to point others to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand and let us sing together.